So my topic is the Jesuits and the arts and basically the old society of Jesus, that is to say before the suppression in 1773, so 1540 to 1773. Before I get into that specific topic, I want to make two preliminary, uh, mention of two preliminary things. First, what about the writing of Jesuit history today? I think we are in a golden age of writing the history of the Jesuits. And this golden age began about 20 years ago. What's happened? All at once the Jesuits have been discovered. And they've been discovered by people who are not Jesuits, many not Catholics, and people in, uh, scholars in diverse fields, including the arts. So I must say that uh, one of my specialties is the history of the Jesuits, and I cannot keep up with the literature. The North America is a leader here, as is France, but the real leader is actually Italy these days. So it um, gives me a lot of excuses to go back to Italy, so <laughs> all is well. The second thing is this is about the Jesuits uh, and the arts, but we need to put this into a bigger context. The uh, last week I was, I'm on a board that uh, reviews uh, uh, proposals for books and we, we give grants. It's uh, an organization I belong to in Philadelphia, the American Philosophical Society. And we had a proposal called Religion in Five Objects. The objects were incense, bread, stone, paint, and drums. And we were giving this grant for the chapter on drums. And the author's point was that um, if you look at religions, indigenous religions, the great religions, uh, they all use these objects to, for their worship and for their meaning. And um, I mean, Christians, I mean, bread and incense and so forth. I mean, and for me, this is a, I just, I thought this was a spectacular project. And it fits so well with Catholicism. Uh, we are very, Catholicism is a very sensuous religion. I like to ask my students, uh, uh, well, at Mass, uh, do music and flowers and uh, vestments and so forth, do they make for a really nice liturgy? Or are they the essence of liturgy? And they all say, oh, they make for a nice liturgy. And I say, no. <laughs> <laughs> They're the essence of liturgy. Liturgy is a performance. It's a sacred action. And the vestments, the music, the architecture and so forth, this is how you're conveyed into that other world that is transcendent. And so at any rate, <laughs> I don't want to go off on that. <laughs> the, um, uh, so within Catholicism, then of course you have the religious orders. If you go to Florence, what are the churches you want to see? You want to see Santa Maria Novella, uh, San Marco, the Dominican churches. You want to see Santa Croce, the Franciscan church. So the religious orders have a a special role here. But, and the Jesuits fit into this context, so I want to make that point. Uh, they're a species within a great genre. But there were some very special things about the Jesuits that are worth noting. You're surprised at that. Uh, and I want to sort of illustrate those as we go along tonight. So the basic question is, why and how did the Jesuits become so involved with the arts, with all of the arts? Well, first of all, if you look at the, the age itself, 1540 to 1773, it was an age mad for beauty, right? Uh, all the, some, the great artists, of course, Michelangelo was still living, uh, Caravaggio, uh, then Bernini and Rubens and so forth, uh, music, uh, uh, Palestrina, Vivaldi, uh, Bach, so it was, a, an age mad for, for art, and Catholicism had the advantage of being strong in Italy, Spain, and Flanders, which were the great centers of art production, especially uh, uh, visual arts. Then there are the founding Jesuits. Uh, they had a, the first 10 members, founders, had a very clerical education in the University of Paris, a very bookish education, but they came from, by and large, noble aristocratic families. 
where being able to sing and to dance uh, was a requisite. So they were sensitive to it. St. Francis Borgia, for instance, who was not one of the first ten, but one of the original Jesuits, you might say, joined after about five years. He was a, the Duke of Gandia, uh, was a, an accomplished composer. And he wrote a mass, for instance, that uh, Orlando di Lasso plagiarized from him. <laughs> so, uh, so that's one part of the foundation. Another piece that's often overlooked but is extremely important was the role of the so-called temporal coadjutors or the lay brothers. Now other religious orders had these lay brothers, let's say laymen, who were members of the order but they were not priests. In the Jesuits, these, the people, the, the, these brothers tended to be from um, professional families. So for instance, some of the first, first two to enter were the two Tristano brothers. They were from Ferrara, from a family of distinguished architects. So they, these were not, didn't have book learning, they didn't have Latin learning, but they were accomplished professionals. And uh, this could be, these, some of these were musicians, painters, uh, artisans of various kind. And they played an immense role in the advancement of art in the, in the society of Jesus. So as I say, that's really not looked upon. Uh, and Andrea Pazzo, for instance, the most, perhaps the most famous of the Jesuit artists, uh, went to the Jesuit school in Trent, where he was born in northern Italy. But uh, he was so, showed such talent as a painter that his father took, her, took him out of that school and sent him to an academy for artists. And later he joined the society as a uh, painter, wrote a book in Latin on uh, perspective, which was translated into English and Chinese almost immediately, uh, and was finally, at the end of his life, was called to Vienna to work for the uh, emperor, and died in Vienna. So these were not minor figures. What were some of the features here, the factors that got the Jesuits involved? Obviously, the first thing was the churches. So you're going to build a church, you're going to have, uh, you need an architect and you need uh, decorations and so forth inside. So the first church to be built, in first new church to be built in Rome in two centuries was the Jesuits Church of the Jesu. Now the new St. Peter's was going up at the same time. But I mean a new church, a brand new church was the Jesu. The imperious patron, uh, Alessandro Farnese, insisted on getting the best architect he could, Manuel Vignola, and that church is sometimes looked upon as the, a turning point in the history of church architecture in the period. Um, the Jesuits employed for their churches also uh, extremely distinguished artists, Rubens was, uh, you might say, the Jesuits artist par excellence, beginning in about 1609 when he was in Italy, uh, did a painting for the church in Genoa, did a, worked on a book in a Life of St. Ignatius, did all kinds of other things, then went back to, to uh, Antwerp and uh, decorated the church of uh, St. Ignatius there in Antwerp, which was the first church in the world dedicated to St. Ignatius. Gian Lorenzo Bernini was a great friend of uh, Father Oliva, the general, and for the Jesuits built a chapel for the novices, Sant'Andrea al Quirinale, which is generally considered one of the Baroque gems in the city of Rome. So they moved in rather high circles. Then there were the missions. This whole problem, this whole issue of evangelization and how to do it. And again, uh, not so much through, uh, of course, through catechetics, but how do you do catechetics? The Jesuits did it by singing. So when the Jesuits arrived in Brazil, for instance, in 1547, they immediately saw the, the, in the, the talent, the inherent talent of the uh, Amerindians there and began to introduced them to Western instruments, Western music. And so 1547, they arrived. By 1553, at Bahia, for Vespers, 
They had three choirs, one with organ, one with clavichord, and one with flute. Go figure. Now, I'm sure that some of you, if I look around this room, some of you remember the movie The Mission. Uh, and with the Guarani and the reductions, this was a place where music played an immense an immensely important role. Uh, and uh, the, uh, that's about all I can say, but I want to say about that at this moment. But then there also, not only were these Indians excellent musicians themselves, but also they be, turned out to be excellent craftsmen and produced organs, violins, cellos, and so forth that were of a quality that would rank with anything in Europe. So it was all part of a program <coughs> of using the arts to evangelize and to arouse devotion and to convey the transcendent sense of what Christianity is all about, what religion is all about. I'll give you an example of some of the work of the lay brothers. There was a German brother, Johann Bitterich, who in, let's see, 1724 wrote to the general and said, we need more artisans here, we need more artists. So 15 architects, carpenters, wood carvers, uh, silversmiths and so forth arrived uh, that year. And then about 10 years later, another 24 arrived and they had with them, let me see, 386 crates of tools and materials. So they were serious. Uh, in uh, 1583 in Japan, the Jesuits founded a seminary, a school for painters. And uh, this was not just painting, but again, it was for silver works, uh, for copper, and it was Japanese and Chinese students working with uh, the European Jesuits and others. So then in, 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 uh, in China itself, an Italian Jesuit, the name of Giovanni Castiglione, another lay brother, uh, became a painter in the imperial court and designed as architect for the emperor a summer palace. So they were busy. So that's all interesting. and. Some of that could be said of other religious orders. The Jesuits are different in one way because they were, there were so many of them I mean, it, compared with the other new religious orders. But um, also then the role of the, uh, of the temporal coadjutors. But the real turning of the tide was the schools. The schools changed everything for the Jesuits. Uh, the, they were founded basically as a missionary order. They were going to do pretty much what the mendicant orders had done, the Dominicans and Franciscans, maybe in a little different style and so forth, but basically that was the pattern. But then in 1548, they opened their first school and that changed everything. How did it change everything? It changed them as much as it changed society. Why did they go into it? They went into it because of the humanistic philosophy that be, was behind these schools. Namely, these schools were student-centered. They were to train boys to grow up to be useful citizens in society and with a strong sense of morality and public service. This appealed to the Jesuits. It was correlated very well with their uh, religious mission and they felt that this long-term dealing with these young men would pay off in the long run. But what this did for the Jesuits was the curriculum was literary. Literature was not taught in universities. It was literary. And it was uh, consisted not only of uh, uh, history and prose and poetry, but also of theater. Uh, and the goal, one goal, was to give these boys poise to give them, make them articulate, uh, to make them capable of taking their place in as leaders in society. So what 
what can I say? The, it's hard to convey the immensity of the Jesuit educational enterprise. Let me, however, give you some figures. By 1750, they had 136 schools in Italy alone. They had 99 in Spain, 167 in Germany, Belgium, Austria, and Bohemia, 91 in France, 139 in Latin America and Asia. So it was a, an immense <coughs> undertaking, an immense enterprise. And one of the most distinctive features of these Jesuit schools, as contrasted with other humanistic schools of the era, was their emphasis on theater and the kind of plays they produced. So in this humanistic philosophy of education, the bottom line was, it's not enough to read a play. You must act it. You must perform it. And the Jesuits went at this with great gusto. Uh, the, uh, both writing plays themselves and then using the pl plays from the classical era and contemporary plays. So in a given school in a, any year, although the normative documents tried to soft pedal this and keep them down, there might be three, four, or five huge productions. In Germany, for instance, especially in Munich, these were um, sort of spectaculous, spect spectacles with hundreds of boys taking part. Uh, special effects was a Jesuit uh, specialty. Uh, <laughs> angels descending from heaven, chariots going up to heaven, thunder, lightning, uh, little visions of hell down below. Uh, and this is how the Jesuits also used their, their, their um, um, special, their, their work in, in science and so forth. Then they had distinguished students, I mean Moliere being one of them, uh, Corneille, Calderon. Other performances, my time's kind of moving right along here. Um, in the awarding of degrees, for instance, have any of you ever been to a defense of a doctoral examination at Georgetown? <laughs> <laughs> Goes on for about two hours and there are questions back and forth and so forth and afterwards if all goes well, there might be a glass of wine. Um, oh boy. Uh, in the Baroque era that we're in, the, these were occasions for great celebration. Uh, the, uh, there might be three or four choirs go on for a whole afternoon. Uh, the room would be decorated, all the rooms would be decorated. The special music would be composed for the affair. Fanfares would be blasted at appropriate moments and so forth. So that was one, so there were all these occasions, the awarding of degrees and uh, canonizations civic events, civic occasions. Uh, with the death of uh, Philip III of Spain, uh, the uh, Jesuits in Milan staged a five-day sort of spectacle of mourning for the city, uh, engaging the whole city, especially with plays and then decorating the cathedral and uh, special music and so forth. What about music? The uh, Jesuits at the beginning, of course, did not and still do not sing or chant the divine office in choir. And indeed, there were all these strictures against music because, with, uh, with members of the order because it would take time, up too much time, and take Jesuits away from more active ministry. Well, that didn't last very long. Uh, what happened? Well, in the churches, the people demanded music. Uh, and they wanted vespers, and they wanted vespers sung. So the Jesuits had to concede to popular demand, you might say. And uh, once they did that, uh, the floodgates had been lifted. And in the schools then, they began to employ a, 
a maestro di cappella, a music teacher. Uh, early on, Palestrina was one of them, then Carissimi, uh, Charpentier, and so forth. So some very distinguished musicians, but every school of any size had a maestro di cappella. Uh, the, there are all these collections of Jesuit music, that is to say, music either written by Jesuits or written by others to be used in Jesuit schools. The largest collection that we have ever found is in, of all places, the Episcopal Archives at Concepcion in Bolivia. It's about 5,000 pages of music, and we know that's not all of it. Uh, the, my good friend who actually speaking this week, uh, uh, Father T. Frank Kennedy from Boston College, discovered a huge uh, collection of Jesuit music and uh, opera, especially, especially opera, in the uh, state archives in Vienna. So there's all this stuff. There are boxes all over the world waiting for historians and musicologists to dig into them. What about opera? Well, yes, I mean, early opera. I've heard three of them. Uh, one, one of the very first, and of course this opera is just beginning, was uh, performed at the Roman College in 1622 to honor the uh, canonization of St. Ignatius and St. Francis Xavier. It's a beautiful opera, it's all allegorical, and the theme is really the harmony of the nations. So these allegorical figures of France, Japan, China, India, Germany, and so forth, come out and do their arias and say, we're all one, we're all one God and so forth. So it's uh, really, a, they're very beautiful. At any rate, uh, these were done on all kinds. I say I've heard three. One was that I heard uh, uh, several years ago was performed in Vienna for the emperor and the empress on Holy Saturday. Uh, it was about Christ's triumph. So, and then oratorios also. Now one of the most interesting features is Jesuits and dance. So with these plays, theater, you needed music, and then especially in the intermissions, the Jesuits would sponsor these dances. The students, actually, they felt that the students, first of all, these were going to be people, in, young men in society, so they needed to know how to dance. So, Every school of any size, besides having a maestro di cappella, also had a maestro di ballo, a dance teacher. So um, the dance was taught to the boys as simply a social grace, but then also for performance because, again, it inculcated poise and grace of movement and then also it was a something to elevate the spirit. It's uh, beyond words, right? Beyond words. So the Jesuit schools, especially in France, became renowned for their ballet. Um, ballet is not the classical ballet that we know today, but the beginnings of it. And matter of fact, Louis XIV used to come to performances of dance at the Jesuit school of Louis Le Grand in Paris. Uh, the uh, in the 17th century, in France, of the 10 works, books, on the theory and practice of dance, seven were written by Jesuits. So they were deeply involved in that aspect of the arts, uh, and something that we sort of forget about today. Um, I might say, too, that they were, the schools and the Jesuits were heavily criticized because of their theater and because of their dance. This was too worldly, especially the Jansenists in France and uh, uh, the Huguenots in France uh, criticized the Jesuits severely. And it was another example of the Jesuits' worldliness and compromising with the world, and uh, it was one of the features, not a 
not the main feature, one of the features that helped lead to the suppression of the Jesuits in 1773. So let me make some concluding observations. To repeat, much of what the Jesuits were doing was also being done by other orders. So we should not fall into the fall fallacy of inflated differences. Nonetheless, the Jesuits were special, first of all, because they had so many schools, because they were so deeply involved in this humanistic philosophy, which led right into the arts, and also because of the special role they gave to the temporal coadjutors or the, or the Jesuit brothers. So it made them, let's say, they fit, the, fit them in that pattern, but they were special. So what then, secondly, once you go beyond church architecture and decoration, what made the Jesuits different was the systemic necessity they had to be involved in the arts. It became part of their system and therefore was not simply something that an individual Jesuit might be interested in or a community might be interested in, but it was something that pervaded the system. And that's another factor that made it special. Uh, then there was a certain foundation for it, a certain rootedness for it, in the Jesuits' foundational documents. I think especially of the spiritual exercises, where St. Ignatius encourages the person making the retreat to make such ample use of imagination and visual, and the, the, the so-called application of the senses, the application of the sense of taste and smell and sight and hearing to the mysteries that are being contemplated. So there's that foundation, I think, there that you can sort of point to. And also at the very end of the spiritual exercises, the contemplation for obtaining divine love, where the person's asked to look at the whole world and see how God is active there. And so this is the whole physical world. So again, a kind of communion with objects, with objects out there. Uh, so for me, what did this do to the Society of Jesus? It gave the Jesuits a cultural mission. They had a pastoral mission, they had an ecclesiastical mission, they had a social mission, they had a cultural mission. Uh, which is, I think, best, the import of it is best conveyed by looking at how they were involved in the arts. Uh, another point, as I mentioned, the arts, especially dance and theater, got them into serious trouble and it helped lead to the suppression of the order in 1773. It was one of the factors leading to the suppression of the order. What about the new society? What about the society that came back into being, was officially reinstated in 1814 by Pope Pius VII? The, the, uh, the tradition had been broken. The continuity had been broken. Moreover, the resources were all gone, except in Maryland. But the resources were all gone. I mean, all the schools had been confiscated, all the, all the buildings were gone. And all the Jesuits basically had to go on was some normative documents. And uh, these documents were, certainly to say the least, did not promote an interest in art uh, and, and the arts. As a matter of fact, in some ways, almost seemed to push them aside. And moreover, we began to live in a very uh, world and in a church where uh, doctrine and ethics, very heady things, were more and more prized, and sometimes you get the impression that that's what religion is all about. Uh, it's about doctrine and about ethics. Well, it's certainly about that, but bigger than that, in my opinion. So religion is not just doctrine and ethics. It's affect, it's senses, it's the sensual. As I said before, for me, music, vestments, flowers, 
gestures. That's the essence of mass. Thank you. If you have questions for Father Romelli, I know he'd be delighted to engage in an audience, and there is a questioner for you. Right, right yeah. Or comments. Yeah, go ahead. It looks like um, the suppression was exactly at the time of the French Revolution. What about the French Revolution in this? Yeah, well, okay, so the Jesuits were suppressed in 1773. The French Revolution began in 1789. So uh, the Jesuits had been destroyed, really, before the revolution broke out. However, there were the, all these objects from Jesuit churches that had been possessed by different people, and they were sold at auction or destroyed or burned and so forth. So the French Revolution in France was, again, very destructive of what was left of the Jesuits' material culture. So, uh, good. Yes? I've been researching an artist uh, who was known as Giovanni Canavesio. He was born about uh, 1450. He signed his masterwork October 12, 1492, Giovanni Caravaggio Presbyter. Could he have been a, a, a Jesuit? No, the dates are wrong. So this, uh, this uh, Caravaggio was, died in 1492, right? No, he signed his, his uh, masterwork at that date. But still he'd be, because the Jesuits weren't found until 1540, so he, that would be almost, yeah, almost impossible, yeah. I'm curious to know who initiated the suppression, what led to it, and what was Napoleon's role later on, because he really created a lot of problems, didn't he? Who did? Napoleon. Napoleon. Yes, but although Napoleon... What started it? It's um, before, and what led up to it? Yeah, well, so the Jesuits were suppressed in 1773, and Napoleon, let's say, 1800, 1805, you know, what, something like that. The, uh, what led up to the suppression? Okay. How much time you got? <laughs> uh, the the Jesuits were managed to have create some good enemies, right? So, first of all, uh, the, the 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 what were some of the gripes against the Jesuits? The first one of the first ones was the Chinese rights controversy. So, uh, in 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 China, as you know, the Jesuits, Matteo Ricci and others, were very accommodating to Chinese customs. They dressed dressed like Chinese spoke Mandarin, wrote in Mandarin, and uh, uh, believed and propagated that the rights in honor of Confucius were not religious rights, that they were civic rights or family rights. But this did not go down in Europe. And uh, they were accused, eventually the Chinese rights were suppressed by the papacy and by 1724. And uh, the uh, uh, Jesuits were accused of being idolaters and betraying the faith. So this, this was, even after Chinese rites were suppressed, this was an ongoing complaint against the Jesuits. That's one thing. A second thing was, a second uh, feature was, it was a perfect storm, really. So you had these people. Then you had the um, um, Jansenists, who were Catholics, but they were, the Jesuits accused them of really being Calvinists because of their radical Augustinian theology, total corruption of nature, and so forth. And they opposed the Jesuits because they felt the Jesuits were too lax. Never heard that before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, were, again, had a very lax ethics, and also were too optimistic about human nature <laughs> and power, power of will. So that's, okay, so. This is, a, this is just a replay. The 21st century is a replay, really. Uh, then the, the philosoph. So Voltaire and that crowd, the, God, the great god reason, uh, they opposed the Jesuits because uh, found the Jesuits maybe their, their best adversaries, their most uh, uh, acute adversaries in, in the Catholic camp. So they were against them. And then the, there was a problem with the, and the, the reductions in Paraguay with the Guarani Indians and so forth, the Jesuits had royal permission to arm the Indians. So, 
So the in, Indians bore arms. They did this for about a, a century to protect themselves from uh, uh, slave traders, marauders. This was fine. But then in 1750, there was a treaty in Smith. So the, the Guarani had to be moved. Uh, the Jesuits were power, powerless here. But the, there was a war, the War of the Seven Reductions. And the French, or the Portuguese, and the Spanish crown used this as an occasion to say, well, the Jesuits were responsible. So all these factors, a perfect storm, kind of came together at the end to get rid of the Jesuits. So they, they did. that's a very quick story. But it, it's, it's fascinating. And uh, I'm having I'm running a book, but go ahead. <laughs> you say, from what you say, they were actually the globalists of the time. Mm -hmm. And Yes. Well, of course, they, I mean, other religious orders were, other religious orders were, especially Franciscans and Dominicans were doing missionary work and so forth. But it would, not, not all the Jesuits agreed, for instance, with that uh, policy of accommodation. But in Japan, it worked marvelously. The Jesuits did it in China, they did it in Vietnam, and they did it in parts of India. So they, that was unique to them, and that's what got them into trouble. That's one thing that got them into trouble. Yeah. Uh, back there, in the court. Is there any evidence, or do we have any remains, or documentation of the, the Jesuit influence in, in art and dance and music in Maryland in the 17th and 18th centuries? Well, I don't think you have it in the 17th and 18th centuries, but Artemis, you have it in the 19th, don't you? You've got some, some documents here that uh, uh, one of our faculty members in the music department is, is studying right now. So, But not in the 17th and 18th century. They were. They were too, there were too few of them, uh, and they were very scattered Catholic population and so forth. There was no way, there was no school until <coughs> 1789, which was after the suppression, right? So the Jesuits were out of, out of existence when John Carroll founded this. But they weren't really out of existence in Maryland <coughs> because they never went out of existence. I don't, I don't expect you to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Father, what uh, what plays were performed? Did they perform plays by Calderon, Moliere, and, and uh, Corneille? Uh, not uh, uh, on only on rare occasion. What they tended to to, uh, to uh, play were the plays from classical antiquity, especially especially the Roman plays, Plautus, Terence, and people like this. Then contemporary Neo Latin plays, although they did do plays in the vernacular. So in Milan, it in the uh, by the 18th century, they occasionally did plays by good contemporary playwrights like Moliere and so forth. But that was not comedy. Do, do you think most of the evidence of these arts has been found? Of the of has the, been found uh, throughout uh, Europe and throughout the rest of the world? You, the uh, evidence of the arts that you talk about? No, I don't think so. I mean, a lot of it has been found. But uh, especially music is, uh, there seem to be uh, there's sort of crates of music all over the place that have not been looked at because they keep 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 bumping into them in unexpected places, like in the, as I say, in the Episcopal Archives in Concepcion, but also, uh, again, my friend uh, T. Frank Kennedy was in, I guess it was in Bolivia, uh, at any rate, found a, a box of music in an attic in a rectory, and it was from the 17th and 18th century. So, so I mean, we now, as I said, you know, we, we have, the last 20 years, we now have a pretty good picture of what it was like. But there are a lot of details that still need to be filled in and can be filled in. So it's still a, a very rich field of, for research. Yes? Uh, to what extent did the Jesuits and involvement in plays choral music and arts play into the suppression? Was that part of what exposed them to the suppression? Well, you know, not so much, not music as such so much, but the music as, uh, as part of theater. So uh, this was not sacred music, right? This was secular music, because these plays, I mean, now the, the plays by the Jesuits and the Neo-Latin plays, a lot of them were moral, moral, moralizing plays and had a Christian theme and so forth. But for the most part, you couldn't say this was sacred music, certainly it was not church music. So along with, I mean, the Jansenists 
were almost obsessed with this idea that Jesuit theater was a corrupting influence, and uh, and then especially with the dance. And of course, the the great center for Jesuit dance was France, and that's where the Jesuits were strongest. Who is responsible? But wait, we have we have one up here, sir. Thank you. When you were discussing the schools and the arts in the schools, you mentioned France, but not Canada specifically. Was, it, was there a different experience in Canada? Well, yes, there was a different experience in Canada. I mean, the, the, the situation was uh, really sort of poverty stricken. And uh, uh, it was the, uh, they tried to do some of these things, but uh, it never took off the way it did in these major or minor cities in France and other places in, in Europe where there was a stable population and a tradition of the arts and so forth. So it never kicked off, just as it didn't kick off here in the, in the States, although for somewhat different reasons. Yes? Oh. You mentioned the Huguenots, but they were the trades and the professions. I don't understand the antagonism between the Huguenots and the Jesuits. Well, well, first of all, the Huguenots were Protestants, the Jesuits were Catholics, so start with that. <laughs> and also, the, uh, the Huguenots themselves were Calvinists, so uh, this meant that they were, uh, I mean, we would use the word maybe puritanical or very uh, austere in their devotion, in their churches, uh, whereas the Jesuits, I mean, you take a congregational church in New England, and take uh, a uh, the Jesu in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> You're in two different worlds. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, what specifically about theater got them in so much trouble? <laughs> well, well, the very fact of theater that this was a worldly entertainment. Uh, so it, it's about all I can tell you. Theater. I mean, theater had a bad name. The English bad, Calvinists bad suppressed people. Shakespeare. Wait a minute, the, what? The English Calvinists suppressed Shakespeare. There you go. <laughs> so, this kind of chair. Okay, Leon. Um, how would you? Uh, I'm just talking. Yeah. How would you characterize the Jesuits' role in the arts today? Well, I thought I'd get that question. I would say, not much. You know, it's. Uh, the tradition is broken, and uh, we, we live in such a different culture. Uh, we talk a good game about it, and I think it would just be very hard to get it going. Uh, it's uh, the culture, the Jesuit <coughs> culture, uh, doesn't sort of foster it. And uh, we today, I mean, the arts are entertainment. There's they're something we do in our leisure, right? They're not part of our experience, not part of the way we live. Whereas, especially in the Baroque era, it was the era of festivals. Uh, these celebrations would go on for days or weeks. And uh, the uh, music and so forth, I mean, the, uh, this uh, Anthony Del Donna, who's on our faculty here, wonderful musicologist, studies the Jesuit uh, music uh, tradition in Naples in the 17th and 18th century. And in the Jesu Nuovo there, the big Jesuit church, uh, every, once every month on Saturday, there was a musical performance sponsored by one of the Jesuit sodalities there. And these were local musicians who uh, was, part, was part of, part of, civic life, part of daily life. It was, and you didn't have television. You didn't have these little gadgets and so <laughs> Yeah, over there, BBS. Um, can you talk a little bit about the kind of education that John Carroll would have received at Saint-Omer and how that might have informed the view that he had for George Tech? Well, I think ver ver he would have received an education along the lines I described. So it would have been a humanistic education, that is to say it would have been based basically on literature, looked at broadly now, history, poetry, oratory, those sorts of things, with performance and with the idea of uh, creating a public person 
a person of upright morals with a good ethical background and so forth. So that's exactly what John Carroll would have, would have, uh, would have studied. And so I think it does. I mean, so Georgetown College, or Georgetown Academy, right? It means Georgetown Academy. The program was basically the old humanistic program. Uh, so, uh, and that's still, when we talk about the humanities today, uh, it's gone through all kinds of transmogrifications, but uh, that's basically what we're talking about. It's, a, it's an education that is broad op and opens you up to other experiences and that has a moral religious component to it and so forth. So uh, that's, and that's the way, that's the way people were educated. I mean, my, my mother went to, not to a Jesuit school, but to a convent school and uh, she had this kind of an education. She had six years of French, four years of Latin, botany, theater, music, and so forth. She was finished when she was 18. She was done, that was it. Education was over. There was no, re no reason to go to college. You, to go to university, you'd done it. Uh, so that really began to disintegrate uh, in the 20th century, change in the 20th century. I think there was going to be a question back there about who actually suppressed the Jesuits. Was it a cabal? Was it the Pope? What happened? Uh, it was, the Jesuits were suppressed by Pope Clement the 14th uh, in 1773. He did this under pressure because France, Spain, Portugal, Austria, Parma, Naples were <coughs> threatening, insinuating schism. So the papacy was at a very weak ebb there. There's a good chance for them to uh, humiliate the papacy as well as to get rid of the Jesuit pest. So uh, uh, now, the, 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 of course, this, the bull of suppression could be enforced only by the uh, secular rulers, right? And the bishops couldn't do this. So Catherine the Great of Russia refused to suppress the Jesuits. So that little nucleus survived and the papacy looked the other way. And so then that was the nucleus out of which the society was finally came back into being in 1814. I think we're about Okay. Maybe this is the moment you mentioned in the context of 20th century and continuation of uh, Jesuit support of the arts, to pay tribute to Father Hanna. Oh, yes, absolutely. Who assembled this outstanding print collection on next to nothing on a shoestring, driven by passion, interest, and knowledge, and rendered everybody, including many printmakers and artists in Washington, great service. Yes. So supportive. This was a, a tribute to Father Howard, who died about five years ago, four years ago, a Jesuit from, who was uh, very, I, don't, I forget now exactly what position he had at the university, but uh, very influential within the university. He was a great collector of prints and so forth, very passionate about it. And uh, was as uh, uh, this lady says here, it's like, this is a good occasion to pay tribute to him. So on that note. <laughs> <laughs>